Uh, all right. Uh, last time I uh, ended by talking about fructans, which is an enormous family of um, uh, soluble fibers that have a common uh, motif of being long fructose chains, long fructose polymers that are capped uh, by a glucose uh, residue. Um, and then a lot of the variation, so inulin uh, pictured here is sort of the like the, the mother fructin. Um, and a lot of uh, the other variations in the family of fructins are going to be uh, going to have arborizations or branches off of uh, the inulin structure. So when you look at this structure here, you see this long chain of uh, fructose um, that, that can extend for hundreds, that N on there can, can be hundreds, um, and then it can uh, get capped by the glucose. And so the other members of that family can have uh, various uh, branches off of that with other uh, types of sugars, uh, anacetylated sugars, um, different residues. Uh, so, but inulin itself is really common, and in fact, inulin is uh, found in all of uh, those vegetables up there in the table on the left. I just highlighted uh, the ones that have a really high percentage of inulin in particular. Uh, it's, it's really concentrated in um, garlic and onions, chives, scallions, uh, things like that, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, they're so uh, healthy for you um, because of their soluble fiber. Uh, and it is, in fact, in wheat. Uh, there is a, a significant amount of inulin in wheat. Um, and asparagus is a, is a fun way to get your inulin. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's a soluble fiber. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's going to help uh, in terms of uh, being hydrated and helping... Uh, ease passage of uh, yeah your 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 feces through your, your the bolus through your D, uh, GI tract. It's going to uh, reduce the glycemic load that a meal is going to uh, cause. Uh, it's going to reduce uh, the absorption of cholesterol and triglycerides um, if it's eaten with uh, those kinds of fats, um, and those are all sort of related to the biophysical properties uh, that inulin has as a sugar that is not going to be able to, we don't have the enzymes uh, in our bodies to break down uh, a fructose beta 1, 2 fructose linkage. Um, and so it's going to pass from the stomach and the small intestine, which is where we make enzymes to break stuff down into the large intestine. And once it gets to the large intestine, uh, there are going to be bacteria that can handle this for sure. It will get fermented. It'll be broken down and then go through a process of fermentation. Uh, but um, some of that, it will be resistant. Um, so, uh, inulin. Yeah, the primary nutrient absorption happens in the small intestine, like where you, you get all your nutrients. You absorb the nutrition into the blood, and then the large intestine is uh, basically dehydration of the feces. Um, so you put a lot of fluid into it in the stomach and the large intestine. There's a net efflux of, of fluid uh, from tissue into the lumen of your GI tract in the stomach and the small intestine. And then in the uh, large intestine, we take it back out. Uh, we, we dehydrate the feces to maintain water, and then there's compaction of uh, the stuff, and then you have bacterial fermentation. Uh, the, the large intestine really is sort of the compost bin of the body. All right. Does that make sense? We'll get to the GI tract, I promise. I mean to. Um, I'm, I'm realizing that there's more material uh, that I had wanted to cover than a semester can handle, but... Uh, here's pectin. We have some experience with pectin from last semester, uh, from last week. And uh, pectin is uh, a, an alpha-1,4 repeat of galactose, and a particular type of galactose, an oxidized form of galactose called galacturonic acid. Um, galacturonic acid has the C6 
uh, hydroxymethyl group, that carbon that, uh, let's see, so here's some cellulose, uh, here's a cellulose polymer, but um, this, so in galactose, this would be a chimerized, the, the hydroxyl will be up and then hydrogen will be down, but here's the hydroxymethyl group that's sticking out uh, of the side of the glucose ring. In galacturonic acid, this is oxidized, one of these hydrogens is gone, uh, these hydrogens are both gone, pardon me, and it's double bonded to an O, so this becomes a carboxylic acid um, from that carbon. All right, so it's been oxidized. And galac uh, galacturonic acids and, and glucuronic acids, all the uronic acids are uh, important components of different structures in the body. You need them. Um, like, for example, you'll find them in hyaluronic acid and cartilage, uh, cartilaginous and extracellular matrix stuff. It's kind of the like slippery goo uh, that makes the body uh, work the way it works. So these kinds of sugars are really important uh, to be able to, to get. And pectin is, is a source of uronic acids, in, in particular galacturonic acid. Um, so uh, what does uh, pectin do for the plants? Well, it's, it's a structural element uh, in uh, the outside of the cell uh, wall. Um, on plants uh, that live on, on land. Um, so there are different types of uh, pectin, and this uh, uronic acid, this carboxylic acid at the C6 that I pointed out, I probably should have made a model of this, um, but you see there in the bottom center, uh, I have this methoxygalacturonic acid. Uh, the that hydroxyl group of the carboxylic acid, the OH group uh, in the C uh, double bond O, OH, um, that H has been removed and replaced with a methyl group. All right, so it's a methoxy galacturonic acid. And uh, there can be varying degrees of methylation of that uronic acid uh, group in um, pectin. And so the, the degree to which that uh, hydroxyl group has been, or, or that acidic proton has been replaced by a methyl group is going to affect uh, the physical properties of the pectin, all right? And um, when you, so we were using, uh, I believe, a high methoxy uh, pectin when we were making our jelly, but uh, low methoxy pectins lead less to jellies and more to like solid uh, gels or even like kind of gummy-like uh, things. Not, not gummy in particular, but uh, that kind of consistency, like really dense, uh, re really highly dense, chewy uh, type uh, gels if you have low methoxy uh, pectin. Pectin itself, like you can, you know, the high level food, uh, you know, culinary arts uh, would... Uh, be a, you know, these people would, would look to order very specific uh, methoxy content in their pectin for a very specific uh, food application. Um, so if you're making some kind of confection or some kind of even savory uh, gel of some sort. Yeah, George. Um, slightly off topic, but what is mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so... <clears throat> An ester is uh, an ester is you have some carbon that is double bond O O H uh, here, all right, and then you're going to have um, some other alcohol uh, down here, and what when you form an ester, uh, you get a dehydration reaction. Maybe I'll turn this so it'll get on there because I haven't been able to get that in work recently. Um, and this gives you so this structure, a C double bond O, O, uh, C bridge. Uh, so, like this would be, we were talking about this being a glycoside, right? A glycosidic bond. This would be an ester. And uh, a methyl ester, a esterification is just this reaction. Uh, so you're forming an ester, like polyester is just taking uh, 
a, a molecule that has this carboxylic acid on one end and an alcohol on the other end, and then causing a chain reaction that is, uh, in fact, they use like, uh, like, a, like a vinyl, uh, uh, a vinyl carboxylic acid, a short two carbon uh, thing, and they can make long chains of a, of a polymer, like a really macromolecule, by just having like consecutive dehydration reactions. Esters themselves, um, that chemical structure is a structure that sets off a lot of odorant, uh, odorant receptors, olfactory receptors in the body. Um, so a lot of the esters uh, that you may come in contact with are going to be things that have um, really distinctive smells, uh, distinctive aromas. Um, yeah. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Damn it. Nope. All right. Don't want me to write any more structures on the board. Um, okay. Pectin. Any other questions about that? Fun compound. Xanthan gum. I realized the other day when I was talking in lab, we were talking about lecithin, and uh, I had, pardon me, <clears throat> I had said that lecithin was from a bacterial strain. Uh, my mind was completely juggled, and I, who was it? Somebody kind of raised their eyebrow at me, but wasn't brave enough to totally call my bullshit. Who was that? Did anybody pick that up? Someone, it was, it was a female. I feel like it was, I feel like it was you two. I feel like it was Megan and Annika. Did you guys talk about lecithin in your podcast? You did. I didn't know. You didn't catch. Oh, oh, you didn't. Okay. One, it might have been you then, because I feel like one of you guys was like, eh, maybe not. Um, all right, maybe I imagined that, because I was unsure a little bit. This is what I was thinking of when I was talking about lecithin. Lecithin is in a bunch of vegetable sources, plant sources, uh, primarily, primarily um, sourced from soy. They get soy, uh, soy lecithin, but... Uh, yeah, xanthan gum is a, is a totally different beast, um, and it is not actually especially common in the, uh, in the natural world. However, we have identified it, humans have identified it as a product of the bacteria Xanthomonas campestris, um, and this is the bacteria that gives rise to, um, has anyone ever seen like broccoli, or, or not broccoli, uh, cauliflower that's been in the fridge too long uh, and it starts to get that weird sort of gray gray film on parts of it. You ever seen that? Yeah, we probably don't. It's not mold. Well, it is. I mean, it, no, it's not. It's like, it's this bacterial rot. It's, it's not actually mold. No, it look, you would probably think it was mold, but it's, it's this like gray uh, sort of modeling that happens uh, to less than totally fresh uh, cauliflower. I'm sure as you get older and uh, have kids and, and have cauliflower sit in your fridge for uh, a couple weeks, you will become familiar with it. But eventually, you'll see it. And uh, it is this, that's the bacteria that's giving rise uh, to that uh, black rot. Um, so, uh, this bacteria, Xanthomonas campestris, is making, uh, one of the things it's making is xanthan gum. And you may say, well, why do we care about this, like, gray modeling on, uh, on cauliflower, uh, you know, something that doesn't sound particularly appealing? Well, this uh, exopolysaccharide that uh, it makes is actually quite useful. It has been identified, isolated from this bacteria, uh, and... Um, is used for a tremendous number of commercial purposes. So what is it? Um, the core of xanthan gum, has anyone ever heard of xanthan gum? Do you guys, are you guys label readers, any of you, on the stuff you eat? Yeah. Uh, if you are at all, you'll have seen xanthan gum. Um, I, I'm positive all of you have eaten plenty of it in your lifetime. Uh, the core of it is, if we look at the top there, it's this Gluck beta-1,4 Gluck. Gluck beta-4,1 Gluck. Glucose beta-1,4 linked to another glucose in a long chain. It's in a long, long chain. And you can see that it's in brackets. It goes out 
uh, in either direction for quite a long ways. And uh, we haven't talked about this explicitly a whole lot. I was going to talk about it in a couple slides here. Um, does anyone recognize that linkage? What did I say about that linkage? Gluck beta 1, 4, gluck. That's cellulose. It's wood. That's the cellulose. Cellobios uh, is the gluck beta 1, 4, gluck. And then cellobios in a long chain is cellulose. That's wood fiber. Um, so it's a, it's a long backbone of gluck beta 1, 4, gluck. And that's a really common motif in a lot of polysaccharides that you're going to see for obvious reasons. Um, and I, I have a... Uh, tetrasaccharide of uh, gluck beta 1, 4, gluck uh, right out here. So last time I had gluck alpha 1, 4, gluck, right, starch. And because of the linkage of the glycoside, it was curved. Uh, but here in cellulose, when you stretch it out, it lays nice and flat. Um, and then xanthum uh, is unique because it starts to have this, uh, these branch uh, branches off of it, every other glucose. Uh, and they're kind of a weird branch. So um, there's a, a man 1,3 gluck beta 1,3 uh, or man alpha 1,3 uh, glucose um, is the first linkage that comes off. And that uh, mannose isn't just mannose. It's actually uh, a, a methyl ester to the, uh, to the C6. You'll see that sticking off that, that first man in the branch. And then there's uh, a couple more residues. There's a glucuronic acid. There's another mannose uh, at the very end. And then that mannose has another thing, uh, another little tweak sticking off the end of it uh, called pyruvate. It's a three-carbon uh, molecule related to sugars that um, is attached to both the uh, O6 and O4 of the mannose. So a pretty weird uh, side chain. But xanthan gum, um, beyond being a really strange looking sugar, is an extremely useful one. It's, it's really potent. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of xanthan to make something super thick. Uh, and they use it in everything from ice cream you see there to toothpaste, uh, pop tarts, lipstick, like all kinds of other cosmetics. It's, it's really all over the place. It's, it's a non-toxic um, it's a non-toxic, potent thickening agent that, um, that acts as a soluble fiber. It doesn't really do much to your body. Uh, it, it acts in much the same way other soluble fibers do. Uh, but it gives a lot of the uh, processed foods and other products that we use, toiletries and cosmetics, the kind of consistency that we have come to like and expect it ends up um, creating a sort of matrix, a jelly-like matrix for whatever the thing is that we're going to use. It gives toothpaste the paste aspect of it, right? Because uh, one of the, the principal ingredients in toothpaste are, um, you know, like carbonate of some sort. It's, you know, sodium carbonate, uh, baking soda. And then they, they uh, make this gel, and they stick some mint in there, and they put, like, other flavorants or whatever it is. Uh, but the xanthan gum is what gives it the consistency that we've come to uh, expect. And lipstick, you know, if, if well, lipstick would not be as popular if it was, like, this soupy container that you had to dip your finger in. And, and you know, you want, you want lipstick to be this sort of, like, creamy gel that stays in place and doesn't sort of run all over the place, right? Xanthan gum does that for you. All right, so I had talked uh, about soluble fibers. Let's talk about some insoluble fibers. Insoluble fibers are uh, fibers that are not going to go into solution. And the biggest insoluble fiber uh, on the earth is cellulose. Um, Cellulose is one of a host of various types of uh, insoluble fibers called beta-glucans. Uh, beta meaning they're beta-linked, and glucan meaning they're beta-linked glucose molecules, and cellulose being the most uh, important. So here is a little fragment of the, uh, the glucose uh, chain. And in, in fact, uh, it, this diagram shows the... Uh, 
it shows the glucose uh, rings all facing the same direction in this long chain, but, it, but in fact, that's not correct. Uh, they alternate up and down, and they're able to make this uh, complicated an incredibly stable hydrogen bonding pattern in a nice linear array. That bond angle isn't something that's a little bit tweaked, so it creates a spiral. It's it's a 180 degree uh, bond angle across the length of the cellulose, so you get uh, nice straight uh, fibers. It's really the by virtue of the fact that it's able this glycoside is able to have a 180 degree. Uh, relationship between the two uh, adjacent rings that has enabled this linkage and cellulose in general to fill this niche in, uh, in biology, in life on earth, in, in plants. Uh, they're able to take advantage of this highly strong, uh, highly resistant to uh, proteolytic activity, uh, linear structural polysaccharide. We eat it. It's in all kinds of foods. Uh, no, I'm not telling you to go out and take a, a branch off a pine tree and chew on it. That's not the best way to get cellulose in your, in your diet. But it is a component of cell walls and a lot of the food we eat. All right? So cellulose. It's in your food. Uh, in fact, um, it's an additive to all kinds of foods that you wouldn't think of it. In fact, uh, like who uh, we had pasta last night and uh, at my house. I'm kind of a do-it-yourself person. I make my pasta sauce out of tomatoes and I shred my cheese. But uh, for those of you who prefer your cheese in a can, uh, like to, to sprinkle the shredded cheese on your pasta uh, from the craft shredded Parmesan or whatever, that stuff is actually anywhere from 15 to 40 percent cellulose fiber uh, that they just wood pulp. Look on the um, the ingredient list sometime, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's uh, microcrystalline cellulose. It's just little uh, fragments of s literally sawdust that they stick in that cheese to help it uh, not clump together, right? I mean, if you shred cheese and you kind of compact it with time, it'll sort of stick together, right? And that's not what you want in the cheese that you shake out of a can. Um, so they put the sawdust in there to keep it uh, friable and, and broken apart and, and easily sprinkled. On, on your food. Um, if you don't like that, shred your own cheese. But cellulose isn't going to hurt you. It's, it's just insoluble fiber, bulk in your gut. All right. Uh, another type of beta glucan that is in our diet is chitin. Um, and the biggest source of chitin that you're going to have uh, dietary is going to be. Uh, mushrooms. Um, it is, chitin is also the principal structural uh, polysaccharide for uh, arthropods. Uh, so like the exoskeletons of insects and, and crustaceans. Um, I don't know if anyone eats insects in here, but I imagine uh, many of you have eaten crab or, or lobster. And uh, you're probably not getting a whole lot of chitin from that, however, because um, it's, it's in the shell of, of those uh, creatures. But you do get it uh, from mushrooms. What is it? Um, it is very, very similar to uh, cellulose, except instead of um, being a glucose, beta 1, 4 glucose, it's a glicnac, beta 4 glicnac. Glicnac? What are you talking about? Well, uh, glicnac uh, stands for N acetyl glucosamine, um, and it's a type of glucose, it's a type of glucose where uh, the O2 hydroxyl, the carbon, the hydroxyl on carbon 2 uh, has uh, been N-acetylated. Um, and you can see here uh, on N-acetyl glucosamine on the left, bottom left, that that O2, instead of it being an O, it's an N. That's the uh, amine group, but that it's been acetylated. Uh, and there's an acetyl group. There's a carbon with a double bond O and a methyl sticking off of it. Uh, and it's attached to the N. So we call that N-acetyl glucosamine. Glucosamine, not N-acetyl glucosamine, but just glucosamine, uh, would have just an NH2 attached to that uh, spot instead of the OH. And not all that acetyl group down there. But this is what we call N-acetyl glucosamine. Um, and N-acetyl glucosamine and just glucosamine in general, uh, 
the non-acetylated, um, is really important because your body needs it, your body synthesizes it, uh, your body gets it nutritionally, and it uses it to make um, different, uh, like it's in your cartilage, it's in uh, the, the, uh, the fluid in the bursal sacs, what are the, the synovial fluid, uh, it's an important component of a lot of extracellular matrix uh, polysaccharides your body makes. So uh, it's really important to make sure you're, you're eating some N-acetyl glucosamine in your diet. It helps uh, make sure that there's enough of it on hand for long-term uh, joint health. All right. A lot of people try to like, when they get old, their joints start going bad. They start like buying expensive pills of this stuff, which is basically just ground up lobster shell. Uh, it's probably wasting uh, their money a little bit. Uh, you should be aware of it uh, throughout your life. Not that it's hurting, but it's it's a lot of money to spend for very little uh, return. Was it Jake's? J what, what was your definition of superfood again? I like that. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis that you did. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like that. All right, so lignin. Um, lignin is uh, a type of fiber. Uh, it is, uh, I, I'm going to want you to memorize that structure uh, for, the, for the test. Um, no, <laughs> at least you smile. <laughs> lignin is, I'm putting that picture up there because it is super complex. And that's just like a, a possible structure. It can have like infinite possible different variations on on that thing well infinite but you know infinite's a big a big number but you know what i'm saying like an enormous possible number of variations on a general structural theme um and i didn't even include the carbohydrates if you look in the middle of that mess there you'll see a little par parenthetical carbohydrate uh stuck in the middle of it that's why it's even in this lecture because the uh, lignins have little carbohydrates, uh, atten or large ones, uh, attached to it. So lignins are really complex structures that are structural elements uh, in cell walls. They're these massive polymers that form this mosaic of uh, structural uh, aromatic uh, hydrocarbons. Um, and there are these, yeah, cross-linked phenolic polymers. Phenolic, just, you see all these uh, hexagons with a circle in it? Uh, that's a phenol group. And uh, they're all cross-linked into these massive, really complex polymers. Um, lignins are in all of the foods you eat. Most, I mean, all the, the natural ve uh, vegetative, vegetable foods you eat. Uh, carrot, spinach, kiwi, curly kale, radish, asparagus, rhubarb, pear, apple, kohlrabi, for example, many others, many, many others. Um, so uh, lignans, the exact, uh, beyond the benefits that they have uh, as an insoluble fiber, that all insoluble fibers have, the exact uh, biological properties that one type of lignin would have over another is an active and enormous area of study, as you may well imagine. So I'm not going to even open up that can of worms more than it is, unless uh, someone's really curious. Yeah. Small question. What's kohlrabi? Kohlrabi? It's great. Uh, kohlrabi is a kind of a baseball-shaped um, vegetable that's it's green, and it has uh, sort of like thin little leafy stalks that come off of it. Uh, which you can cut those and braise them. Uh, and then the actual baseball uh, body of uh, the vegetable can be sliced up and sautéed. Um, it can be eaten raw on salads. It does seem a little bit woody because there's a lot of lignin in it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a folksy vegetable. I don't know. It must be originally from Asia. I don't, I don't know. See a picture of it there? Is that the way I described it? There it is. Yeah, it's good. Go buy some kohlrabi sometime. You can get it at farmer's markets. Pretty popular farmer's market vegetable. Anyone else have it before? No? Surprise. Uh, you can put it in soup. 
Uh, it's really good instead of broccoli and like a cream of kohlrabi soup. If you want to get real. Uh, a little. It tastes a lot like broccoli stem. I don't know if you ever take a bro like a thick broccoli stem. You can slice that up and make, instead of au gratin potatoes, you can make au gratin broccoli stems. This, that's part of the, like, you know, there's this movement. Uh, foodies try to, like, you know, food waste is a big foodie issue now. So, like, taking parts of things that normally went in the compost bin and doing other things with it. Um, yeah, kohlrabi, it's, it's good. You can steam it and put lemon and salt over it. You can, yeah, let your imagination be your guide. Maybe make some kohlrabi ice cream. Seems like someone would eat it. Get some xanthan gum and some kohlrabi. No. Okay, who knows, man? Has anyone had red bean ice cream before? Yeah, that stuff's good. All right. Uh, resistant starches. Um, so these are some naturally occurring starches uh, that your body doesn't quite have the firepower to break down and to absorb. Uh, and so uh, they pass from the small intestine into the large intestine where the bugs that live there, all your friends, your, your, your team, your coworkers down in your gut, are able uh, to ferment them. They break them down uh, into various uh, complicated metabolic uh, components. So uh, resistant starches are important because they tend uh, to have all kinds of uh, great properties. They, they've been shown to help inhibit cancer. They can stimulate the immune system. And they definitely uh, reduce the glycemic response. Um, I keep using that word glycemic. We're going to unpack that word more when I get into metabolism. But uh, what are some sources? Well, there's a lot of them. Here's a couple uh, common ones. Uncooked oats. Um, I don't know if you're, uh, probably most of you aren't into just like spooning up a bunch of oats out of a horse bag. But um, if you eat mucili, that is uh, uncooked oats, uh, and you can get 17.6 grams in a cup. That's actually a lot of resistant starch. Uh, white beans, look at that. That looks delicious. Uh, green bananas. Has anyone ever cooked green bananas? Yeah, that's good, isn't it? I like it. Yeah. Um, and barley is really high in resistant starch. So there, there's some sources of it. Really good for you. Eat, eat it while you can this life. All right, this is probably the last slide, data slide. Uh, here is a picture of bran. Now, I have gone through like all of these different kinds of fibers, haven't I? All sorts of different soluble and insoluble fibers. Um, and many of them are found all in the same package. When I would give an example of this food has this uh, fiber, it doesn't really work like that. This food has an array of different fibers that serve uh, different purposes in different structural components of that food. Uh, I, I started this segment of the lectures, maybe on Monday, uh, by talking about Louis Sullivan, didn't I? The structure function guy. And uh, indeed, these different fibers have the structure they have uh, because they serve different functions in the plant, in the organism uh, that is producing them. So let's, let's look at wheat. This is just an, an easy example because all of us, unless you are uh, really severely celiac, uh, have, uh, have eaten some of this in your life. And in fact, even the celiacs would have had to have eaten some to know they were celiac. Um, the bran, uh, wheat bran, uh, is often isolated by itself, but it's this, uh, this outer layer of the wheat berry, the outer layer of the wheat berry. And we find a lot of uh, the fructin content, uh, like the inulin, for example. We, sa we said that uh, wheat was really high in inulin, uh, which is one of the fructins. Uh, that's found in the bran, on the outside of the wheat. Um, there is some resistant starch as well found in this outer uh, covering. And so the bran itself has a couple different layers. There's the very outer layer of the bran. Um, and what's in there? Well, we have uh, cellulose. We talked about cellulose. There are uh, 
I, I had talked about hemicellulosis, and the example I had put up on the board was Arabinose Island. Well, turns out Arabinose Island is found in the outer bran layer. And then lots and lots of lignin, that super crazy complex chemical mishmash of the polyphenolic uh, polymers that I'm going to make you draw in detail on your uh, next exam. <clears throat> and then uh, below that is uh, the alerone. And the alerone is actually not part of the outer bran layer, but when it's part of the uh, inner endosperm um, of the uh, of the uh, wheat berry, uh, but when you're removing it, it, it travels with the bran, so it's included over here. And this again has hemicellulose. Uh, the Arabinose Islands has uh, other beta glucans uh, in there, um, and then there's a lot of other uh, uh, nutrients that are less important to this particular lecture, but no less important to your body. Um, then moving further into the body of the wheat berry, we have what's called the endosperm. The endosperm, this large uh, starchy uh, component. This is sort of like uh, the energy reserve of the, of the wheat uh, berry for when the wheat germinates and uh, grows. It's going to burn a lot of the uh, starch that's in there. Um, there are a lot of uh, structural elements that give the endosperm its, uh, its uh, form. Hel uh, cellulose, more uh, hemicellulosis, xyloglucans, glucomannan. These are, these are some other polysaccharides I didn't get a chance to talk about. Lots of resistant starch um, in there. Um, and there's uh, lots of protein as well. It is uh, this protein um, that is where the gluten resides. And so gluten uh, is not a carbohydrate. It's, it is a protein. And uh, gluten is what gives bread its sort of uh, nice, stretchy, chewy, uh, delicious uh, gooiness when you, when you chew it up. But um, it's primarily found in the endosperm of the wheat berry. Um, and then uh, all the way inside is the germ. And this is the part of the wheat berry uh, that is going to be um, the germative aspect, as the name would have you uh, believe. So that's going to be uh, the part that grows. It's kind of the seed part of it. Uh, this is where the genetic material, the growing uh, root tips of, of um, if you were to germinate a wheat berry, this is the part that would uh, grow up and form the plant. Uh, so this, again, has cellulose, fructans, lignin. It's all throughout there, um, and a lot of uh, fat. Uh, any fat that is found in uh, wheat is going to be uh, located in the germ. So, all right, there's a wheat uh, berry. Summary, I had promised you guys a summary. Um, so here's just a slide that... Uh, summarizes some of the disaccharides and polysaccharides I talked about. I talked about lactose uh, last week. I talked about that was the milk uh, sugar, and that was a beta-1,4 galactose to glucose. I talked about sucrose, uh, which is glucose and fructose. Um, that's table sugar. I talked a little bit about the fraught history of uh, sucrose consumption and production. Uh, there's... Uh, Amylose, which is plant starch. Uh, it's these repeat alpha-1,4 units of glucose. Um, and then amylopectin, another type of, uh, of vegetable starch um, that is just like amylose, except it has these alpha-1,6 uh, branch points. Um, so this is the pectin uh, that we've talked about. Then there's glycogen. Uh, this is just animal starch, very similar to amylopectin, except the frequency of branch points is uh, much uh, more frequent. All right. um, yeah, just going back sort of uh, in outline form, we talked, I defined what a carbohydrate was, a monosaccharide, the simple sugars, uh, and then we spent a lot of time, probably more time than we should have, uh, talking about stereochemistry and exactly what stereochemistry means. Um, chirality, opt optical activity, uh, what an enantiomer uh, was, etc. I talked about how sugars link together. 
uh, and form the hemiacetal um, linkage, uh, the, the hemiacetal when they form the rings, um, and the difference between aldoses and ketoses. Uh, and then I talked about glycation briefly when you have really high blood sugar and how that can affect uh, certain proteins. Um, and then we started building uh, more complex sugars. Uh, and we moved into the disaccharides, and I talked about a host of those, maltose, cellobios, uh, sucrose, uh, which is broken down by sucrase, the enzyme, lactose, broken down by lactase. We talked about allolactose, which was the effector of the lac operon. Pretty comprehensive summary here, huh? Uh, and then uh, structure function relationships uh, was this week, uh, moving into polysaccharides and uh, the host of uh, storage polysaccharides, amylose, amylopectin, and glycogen, and then the structural uh, polysaccharides, which we broke into, uh, we called them fibers, and we broke them into soluble and insoluble fibers. All right. So that's, that was the whole carbohydrate uh, unit. Thank you for going through that with me and uh, going a minute over with me. Are there any questions?